Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Doug Laramie and I am your sensory evaluation instructor. And we are going to be starting today with the four senses, uh, well, the four that we use in a brewery. So the first one is taste. So the primary organ is the tongue, obviously. So the tongue itself is covered in little, very small finger-like projections called papillae. And the tongue itself, it was once thought to have regions of sensitive areas that would only pick up on certain flavors. So like uh, the tip of the tongue, the sides of the tongue, and the very back of the tongue. Uh, the sides were typically thought to pick up sour only, the back of the tongue was thought to pick up bitter. That has pretty much been debunked uh, and really more replaced with a, a complete understanding of the, the whole tongue has areas that are sensitive to all of the, the tastes. Uh, and really it just makes sense why would it, you know, a certain area be only sensitive to certain flavors. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so there are five main flavors that have been identified and it used to be just four. Generally, the community has recognized the fifth flavor. Well, we'll see what that is. So we've got sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami for savory. Uh, I like umami better just because it's, a, it's the, the better term, in my opinion. So sweet is sweet, basically. It's our ability to sense and distinguish sugar, basically. And the differences in how sweet something is is measured relative to sucrose. So some things are less sweet than sucrose, like uh, maltose, things like that, and some things are much sweeter than sucrose. Uh, artificial sweeteners, by chance, it takes very little amount of some artificial sweeteners to get the same sweetness as sucrose does. So, and they're, they're all relative to sucrose, which is table sugar. Sour is generally our body's way of determining pH, basically. Uh, the more sour something is, generally is in line with the lower the pH, so the higher concentration of hydrogen ions. And different acids are perceived differently. Some acids are perceived as more sour than others, even though the pH may be relatively similar. Uh, and because the pH is a logarithmic scale, a difference of a tenth from 3.5 to 3.4, it can be a huge difference on our palate. It can be a very huge difference. Uh, something at 3.5 per se is, is sour, but pleasant, you know, if it's done correctly. Something of 3.2 to 3.0 is very sour, very puckering. And if done right with, with different additions, it can be very good as well. But it is going to be tiring to drink something that has a pH of 3.0. It uh, is very chokes you in the cheeks. Uh, salty, obviously, uh, the main salt that our body recognizes, sodium chloride. We are programmed to like salty things because traditionally, well, not traditionally, historically, uh, we need salt intake and it was never as readily available to us as it is currently in you know, the last hundred years or so. So we're genetically pre-programmed to like salty things because our bodies need salt. Uh, sodium chloride is not the only salt. Uh, technically, anything that is a combination of a positive ion and a negative ion is a salt. There's only some that uh, we can eat without dying and some that is palatable. Potassium chloride is not one that you would want to eat a whole lot of. Uh, it causes a lot of issues, but uh, the combination in solution does taste salty. A little bit less than sodium chloride as well. Uh, bitter. It's hard to describe. It is definitely something you just have to experience. Uh, and it, with the previous thought that the tongue was only sensitive on certain areas, 
bitterness was thought to be on the back of the tongue, so in order for a person to taste beer correctly, you had to swallow, unlike uh, wine tasters, or unlike coffee tasters, or professionally, they just swish it around their mouth and spit it out. Uh, the wonderful thing about beer is you got to swallow it to get the whole experience. And I still believe that's true. You gotta swallow it to get the whole experience. If you spit it out, you're losing something. You're not getting the whole experience. You're not getting the the uh, retrograde nasal breathing out of all of the volatiles that will cover, you know, with smell and everything. There's definitely something to be said with that. And umami or savory is the most recent flavor to be discovered. Uh, and really, it's been with us the whole time. We just never really recognized it. And it can be explained as the flavors that are produced by, with soy sauce and things like that. Specifically, uh, the receptors are recognizing MSG or monosodium glutamate. That is the most common form of that savory, that umami flavor. So when you hear people saying it doesn't have any MSG, they just mean they haven't added it uh, separately from what occurs naturally in food. So things like soy sauce, uh, shiitake mushrooms, and other mushrooms as well, uh, beef stock, things like that are very rich in MSG, and they give you that meaty, savory flavor, uh, which is named umami or savory, however you want to describe it, but definitely gets you that, that soy sauce, that meat flavor, the essence of everything that is meat, uh, and then the mushrooms just... It's great. Uh, maybe not the greatest in beer, but there are some beers that really do it well, darker beers specifically. Uh, unfortunately, if you get that flavor of soy sauce too much, you have gone the wrong direction. So, some uses of tastes in a brewery. Obviously, the first one would be verifying product quality. So, Ways you can do that is just drinking it, number one. Uh, structured ways of doing that are the best way to evaluate products objectively, if you can. So using blind tastings, triangle tastings, and sensory evaluation panels. Uh, and we'll get into the nitty gritty of those later on in the semester. Uh, assessing product versus known description. So if you have a beer that you've been making for couple years, numerous batches, you know exactly how it's supposed to taste. Uh, you should. We'll put it that way. You definitely should. So knowing your descriptors and knowing what it's supposed to taste like is the best way to evaluate batches going forward. If you're tasting a batch and you're getting something you're not supposed to have, you either need to decide whether or not you're going to continue with it or just decide whether or not it just needs to age a little longer. And that is the most important thing you can do in a brewery is to evaluate your product. Uh, taste being the number one, definitely up there, maybe number one, number tied for number two between smelling, but the best way you can decide whether or not your product is sellable is by tasting it yourself. Uh, identifying issues with a product, especially when a product is out of spec, so you have to decide how it's not meeting your expectations, if you can correct it, and why it's not meeting your expectations, and how you can correct that why going forward for future batches. And that's, that's quality, continuous quality improvement in a nutshell, and we'll cover that more, I'm sure, in multiple lectures and throughout the rest of this program as well. And it's not just finished product or products and works that we have to evaluate. We have to evaluate our raw product, raw ingredients. Because if you don't start with quality, you're not going to end with quality. So when you get your raw materials in, whether it be grain or hops, you can taste the grain, and yeah, it, it'll taste like grain. But something you're looking for is really things that don't taste right. So if you taste it and the grain already tastes sour, I probably wouldn't use it to brew with. Uh, hops, if you get them in, uh, you can taste it. I don't recommend it. From experience, it's a bad, bad experience. <laughs> uh, and generally, everybody that's new coming here at Henderson Brewing Company, I would definitely say put one one pellet in your mouth, 
you'll never do it again. <laughs> it's intensely bitter. <laughs> and another raw material that a lot of people don't necessarily think about is water. Uh, your water, you should be evaluating your water before you use it to brew. Uh, you should check your water before you use it to clean your tanks, just to make sure nothing's really off. You know, that's 95% of your finished product. And you should really just be looking at it and checking it, make sure it, it tastes good. So the next sense that we use in a brewery is sight. A lot of people don't realize it, but we eat and we drink with our eyes just as much as we do with our mouth and our nose. Visually appetizing food and beverages are more appealing. You enjoy them better if they are presented to you in, in a way that really accentuates their beauty. And looking at a product can tell us things about its quality. <clears throat> so a finished, a finished product in a clean glass will interact with that glass and cause lacing. And it's that beautiful foam that sticks to the side of the glass on the way down as you drink it. And lighting can play a key role in how your product looks. So if you've got generally bad lighting, or if it's you're sitting in front of a window and the beer is backlit, it might look turbid, it might look unappealing, it might look different. It's just to show you that lighting can make a huge difference in how you're seeing something. So we're going to go through a couple examples of things that look appealing. So this picture turned out a little grainier than I thought it would, but spaghetti night, you throw it all in a bowl, you heap it up together, and it looks like spaghetti. When presented in a visually appealing manner, it looks much more appetizing. You know, this looks beautiful. This looks delicious. And we've got some fish. This is a piece of artwork on a dish that you can eat. You know, something like that, that is a whole experience. You know, and I'm sure it smells great too, obviously we can't do that, but there's a reason why high-end restaurants plate their, plate their meals in a visually appealing manner. That's part of the experience of going to that restaurant. That's part of the experience of that food rather than just utilitarian eating food to survive. You know, that's part of enjoying the process. There's another thing, that's some what appears to be tempura. And you can just lay it on a plate and people will eat it. But when you present it in a visually appealing way, it just looks so much better. It makes you want to eat the product, it makes you want to enjoy it. And we've got some Beautiful pours of beer. If you've ever had a Trappist beer, they come in that little goblet looking glass. And the presentation of a pour on a beer is key to how somebody interacts with it. When you got a beautiful head of foam on top of it, it's visually appealing. Never mind the functional differences of actually getting a good head on a beer. Visually, it's appealing, it's striking, it's beautiful. You present something to someone like that and it, it creates something subconscious that helps them enjoy their product a little bit more. And then the flip side of it is something like this. You've got what appears to be a very dirty glass. You know, they might have cleaned that, I don't doubt it, but there is a difference between clean glass and beer clean glass. This glass is not beer clean. You've got bubbles all over the place. It looks unappealing. It does not look like something I want to drink. So it, there is a big difference between appealing and unappealing. And I just don't want to drink that. It's, it looks awful. So uses of sight and brewery. Verifying quality of product, of course. Everything, everything I buy in our senses, first and foremost, is going to be verifying quality. So sight variations of color against standard background. So looking at how the color of your beer is supposed to be and how you intended it to be, you want to hold it up against a white color.
color-free background as much as possible. You know, white porcelain, anything white that you have, piece of paper will work pretty well. So you can evaluate the color of your beer and how it's supposed to look. If you're looking at turbidity or how opaque or just dirty it looks. You've got a beer, maybe it's supposed to be looking turbid, like a New England IPA. A certain level of turbidity is desirable. A Hefeweizen, a certain level of turbidity is desirable. Too much, and then it just looks milky, cloudy, looks very bad. And beers that are supposed to be clear, Hi, we're with Jenny Clean. We're here to clean. Okay, alright. Sorry about that. Beers that are supposed to be clear have very low turbidity. They are very crisp and clear. They can see through them to the point where you can read through the beer. You can read something on the other side of that beer. Crystal clear. And we talked about lacing a little bit and head retention. So that, that beautiful cascade of, of foam that sticks to your glass where you can almost see how much you've drank every time you take a drink of that beer. That is a sign of a, a high quality beer in a beer clean glass. And that interaction with that glass is important. And head retention in general as well does show a quality product and it shows a nicely cleaned glass as well. So visually you can identify issues with product like I said before, turbidity is going to be a, a big thing, how cloudy your beer is. If you're about to package your beer and you pour a sample and it is cloudy and turbid and it's not supposed to be, something's going on, you need to figure out what happened before you package that product for sale. Uh, and you need to figure out why that happened so you can prevent it for future batches. Uh, and again, evaluating raw materials. You get a shipment in, you crack open a bag of, bag of malt, and there's a big lump together with white stuff all over it. You're not going to want to use that. <clears throat> I would probably not use that whole bag of malt. Those are issues that come along in the malting process, and that is a, it's a fungal infection that, that occurred. Uh, so you want to look at all of your materials as you're, as you're entering brew day. Visually is one of the best ways to inspect your grain. You're looking for anything that's not supposed to be there, anything that doesn't look like little, little pieces of barley or little pieces of wheat, depending on what you're using. <clears throat> and hops in general, you can tell what they're supposed to look like uh, for the most part. It should be nice, green, uniform. If you get a bag of hops, you crack it open and it's brown, you don't want to use those. I've had some depending on the varietal. Some hops do have a little bit of a more yellowish uh, tent to them, and that is because of their high content of oil and resin. And some hops, that's desirable. So here we have an example of lacing. This is a, a picture that one of my bartenders took of one of our beers on the glass he had at home. Uh, as you can see, all the way down the glass you've got lacing. You can see where he's taking drinks and the whole glass is covered in lacing. That's kind of an extreme example of lacing. Typically you won't see nearly as much as that. That's just one of the one of the finer moments that we've had. So smell. And it's interesting, a lot of what we perceive as taste or flavor is actually what we're smelling. So, what we're experiencing when we drink beer, uh, what we taste, a lot of it is really what we breathe in before we take a drink. So a lot of people, you'll see, they'll put their nose in their beer, they're trying to experience those flavors and aromas. And as you take a drink, a good way to get a full experience is to kind of swish it around your mouth a little bit and then breathe out through your nose. So you're, you're volatiling, volatilizing those aromas that are in the beer and you're forcing them past your basically your sense of smell and when you breathe out at that point and then you swallow and you get the whole experience so your smell can be very sensitive and it 
varies person to person. People have different thresholds for different chemicals. And it really also as well, it depends on your health as well. If you've got a cold and you're stuffy, beer is not going to taste the same to you. You're just not going to be able to smell nearly as much. And the number of chemicals that have been identified that make up flavor and aroma in a beer is now I want to say endless, and I wrote essentially endless, but it is very, very high. And the more we research hops, the more we realize that we just don't know that much about it. The more we research the, the chemicals that are produced during fermentation, the more we realize that we just don't know that much about it. So, smell is something that can be developed. It is definitely something, a tool that you can learn and develop be able to pick out certain flavors and aromas as you learn to taste beer, as you learn to taste foods as well, because there are many foods that have the same flavor active compounds as beers and hops, and that's why a lot of beers are described using food descriptors, so citrusy, fruity, stone fruit, things like that. They have very similar or the exact same flavor compounds in both products. And that's something that by learning fruit, you can develop your beer palate even better. Because if you know what a mango is supposed to taste like, you'll be able to pick it out in a beer that has a combination of fruity hops. So, uses of smell in a brewery, very important, and of course, verifying quality of product, number one. So, measuring in your head the intensity of aroma or the lack of aroma. So, if you crack or you pour a beer, let's say you're pouring a West Coast IPA, you want that aroma to be intense. You want those flavors that you've produced to be intense on the nose. Your ability to decide how intense they are or if they're lacking is how you can verify quality of your product. And that's something that you should be doing just about every single time you interact with your beer, whether it be on the clock or out enjoying yourself. So, identifying issues with product Good aroma, bad aroma. If it's supposed to have an aroma, it doesn't have an aroma. You got to figure out what you did wrong and how to correct that going forward. Bad aromas are going to be a sign of potentially infection, issues with fermentation, and then again, evaluating raw materials. Smelling grain, smelling hops when they come in is definitely something that is paramount just as much as looking and tasting the combination of everything, making sure you have quality materials to start. So touch, uh, not necessarily all about what's in your fingers. Uh, so mouth feel, and I do consider there to be a sense of touch in your mouth, because why not? It's mostly, the sense of touch is mostly just pressure and temperature sensing. Anyway, so mouthfeel is how the beer feels, how thick it feels, how thin it feels, uh, how it interacts with all parts of your mouth. So mouthfeel is very important. So if you've got a oatmeal stout, by for example, that particular beer, it should feel thicker. It should it should feel the same as a pilsner, say. You want it to feel thicker on your mouth, <clears throat> and that, that's very important. If you're if you're wanting to hit that style, you don't want a thin oatmeal stout. Mouth feel is how your body interacts with that and how it evaluates that that feel. Temperature, something you can feel with your hands and your mouth. If your beer is too warm, you're going to have issues unless it's specifically designed to be served in that way. You can have beer served too warm, you can have beer served too cold. 
Brewers Association standard serving temperature is 39 degrees. And now that's for most styles. Styles like American Light Lager, they're designed to be served as cold as you can possibly get it. And that's something that you see at bars around town, coldest beer in town. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's how they're supposed to be served, cold and flavorless. There are beers that are supposed to be served at cellar temperature at 55 degrees. A lot of some darker beers, porters, things like that. They really open up as they warm up and you can evaluate the differences on beers like that. If they're poured at 39, take a few drinks, set it to the side for two or three minutes, let it warm up a little bit, and it's going to be a different experience based on that difference in temperature. And carbonation, very important because beer is supposed to be carbonated, it's supposed to be lively. Uh, unless you get beer served on nitro, things like that, they get that creaminess, but even then it does play a huge key role in that mouthfeel as well. So your sense of touch, you can feel those bubbles erupting in your mouth you can feel those bubbles interacting with everything. And it also gives a taste as well. Uh, there's, there's a difference between, a taste difference between flat beer and carbonated beer. It just definitely is a significant part of the overall experience. So uses of touching a brewery, verifying quality of product. Everything is about verifying quality of product. Uh, carbonation levels, you can objectively measure them with devices. Um, once you experience it enough, you can tell, number one, by how it pours. You can tell how quickly it foams up in the glass. You can tell by how it tastes, if it's carbonated appropriately or not. That is just something that comes with experience. The more and more beer you drink, you can tell. Identifying issues with product, mouthfeel. There is a chemical off flavor called diacetyl. It gives you that butter, popcorn, car not caramel, but toffee-like, uh, butterscotch flavor. It also can affect mouthfeel, and it is described as feeling slick or ropey on the mouth. Uh, not desirable by any means. I've never wanted to taste anything or drink anything ropey before, but that is something, another thing that you, another tool you can use to evaluate whether a non your beer is infected or had a healthy fermentation. And again, touching, evaluating raw materials, touch and feel everything, see if it feels right, interact with the hops, feel how sticky they feel, feel how resin, how much resin in the oil is in them. So bringing them all together, so your overall experience, that, that customer's overall experience of drinking your beer is a conglomeration of all the senses. Uh, it is also a con conglomeration of the experience that you've presented them with in the tap room, uh, or the experience that they are presenting themselves with the package to go product wherever they go. Uh, flavor is a combination of all of these experiences. Good presentation, quality product, makes things that much more enjoyable for someone. Uh, and another thing, and I'll show a picture in a second, what I mean by power of suggestion. Uh, on the consumer side, beer descriptions when written by the brewery are very specific in telling someone what they've intended to be in the beer or what they've experienced to be in the beer. And it helps people taste things they may not have picked up by themselves. We'll see an example here, uh, Bearded Iris, their descriptions can be a little ridiculous sometimes, but they're very thorough. And their presentation, like I said here, visually, it's stunning. And their descriptions, they're describing all kinds of things. This one here, they've got uh, peach pie, funky, guava, paleta, and orange candy. Those are very specific descriptors, and while they may not be technically in the beer, you tell someone that they're going to taste peach pie and they will start to experience it through past experiences. 
the power of suggestion is is real with beer and, and food in general as well. Thank you.